Good afternoon. It's our honor and privilege to welcome you to the BW People Dialogue. Today we are talking to a business leader who also looks at human resources. And I, I want to drive home this point that uh, HR leaders are business leaders. After the pandemic, uh, if we don't see the value that HR professionals, HR leaders bring to the table in all aspects of business continuity planning, in terms of realigning the organization, um, we know that they are business leaders, and I hope more and more CHROs and HR leaders become so. Today we have a special guest with us. Uh, she's been um, somebody who's really made an impact in her job. She's been in her last job for almost 15 years. Before that, uh, uh, she spent five years with another company and two years with another company. So she's not a rolling stone. She stayed in a company for a very long time. So let me, without further ado, Welcome, Ms. Ritu Narang Rakra. She's a regional HR leader for India at the Dell EMC. Welcome, Ms. Rakra, to this BW People Dialogue. We are grateful for your time and presence. Uh, so, welcome to the BW Business World and BW People Dialogue. Today, I've had the pleasure of introing Indra Nui in the morning, and I'm now introing you. So, I feel very happy. But let me start by asking you, Ms. Rakra, how have been the last 18 months for you personally and professionally? So thank you for the very warm welcome. And it is indeed a, my privilege to be here and uh, talking to you on a day when you've even spoken to Indra Noe, another great um, leader in the industry. Uh, the last 18 months clearly have been very uh, challenging, Dr. Patra. Um, I think the entire industry, country, in the entire world has gone through a real massive shift in uh, what, what has occurred during the pandemic. Um, so clearly, you know, we've had to put, each one of us has had to put our best foot forward, not just HR, you've been very kind, kind with your words as far as HR is concerned, but even the business leaders, the employees themselves, and frankly, everybody across the board. Um, so it has been challenging times. And uh, I think uh, we've hopefully gone past the worst and I hope we don't see anything like the second wave again. Um, and, and we're ready to move forward. Okay. Now, this gives me a beautiful segue, Ms. Rakra, into our topic today. We mm -hmm. could discuss anything about business and HR, but we are narrowly at BW people discussing integrating or segmenting what's your mantra of work-life balance. Uh, I think uh, there are mostly negatives of the COVID, the loss of lives, loss of livelihood, but there were some positives. Yes. I wouldn't even call it a mixed bag, but one of them was spending more time with the family, but it also became boundaryless working. However, the organization were progressive, uh, but high performance individuals also have a FOMO. So they, while they like their personal downtime uh, with the competitiveness at the highest levels in organization, uh, you know, it is sometimes difficult to achieve work-life balance, especially when your home is your office and your office is your home. So how do you achieve work-life balance in such a scenario? So Dr. Patra, one thing I strongly believe in is that work-life balance does not occur by chance. It absolutely occurs by design. Uh, we, can, we can have the you know, best of plans, but whether it was pre-pandemic or post-pandemic, one has to sit down and make an honest assessment of one's needs and not just one's needs on the life side, but even on the work side. Once you have that assessment, which you have made, you can then drop a plan and say, yes, this is what works for me. So there are many people who believe that you just chance upon work-life balance. That's not the case. Um, you have to be very deliberate and invest in on both sides, frankly. Um, and, and only then will you be able to arrive at a happy situation which works for you and uh, which gives you a lot of fulfillment from a work perspective. And it also helps you balance out your life. Now, let me ask you, is there a playbook? You said you have to be deliberate, you have to plan. It happens with effort. So is there a playbook for an organization to achieve work-life balance for its employees and colleagues? And is there a playbook for an individual to approach it in a way that he or she is able to achieve work-life balance? Frankly, I don't think an organization can have a playbook for work-life balance because every individual's needs are different. Uh, 
but definitely an individual can have a playbook for themselves. Um, I think a good work-life balance design has to reflect a good amount of satisfying work, uh, balance with the family, balance giving back to the society and making a difference, balance having time for yourself, for your mental well-being, for your physical well-being. I think all these factors have to be considered. And uh, over the years, what I've seen is there are people who've not invested enough in one aspect or the other. To, to really be a, a contented individual, you have to have all aspects adequately addressed. This may mean that from time to time, you actually not only make investment of time, but of some money, ensure you um, invest in resources, um, to help you out with various things. Uh, there is no guilt in saying I need help. Um, and I think that's another thing all of us must accept and acknowledge. Uh, we live in a society where we do have a lot of infrastructure which is available to us. And there is no shame in using that infrastructure. Um, I think we as a society again are very family oriented and therefore have a lot of family support, which again, we should leverage uh, both giving and taking. So I think, you know, there is no template that an organization can have, but there's definitely a template that an individual can have. Um, I also believe that what the organization can do to your point is create the right atmosphere. Um, I think when we went into the pandemic, what we did was we sensitized people managers on the changing needs. I and mean, each one of us had drawn up a very fine balance of our work life, right? And everything went bust overnight. Um, you know, suddenly the entire family was at home, caregiver responsibilities increased, the infrastructure vanished. Um, you know, people, everybody was at home. So you had, you know, space limitations. You had all kinds of challenges that you came upon. Organizations which recognize this early on and addressed it have come out stronger on the other end. And I'm hoping it is the other end already, right? And I think that is the point that each one of us in the HR fraternity have to recognize and, and uh, accept. Um, of course, we also as a company put in place multiple, um, um, you know, programs in place. Uh, we, we put in place things like crisis leave, which is available not only for use by the, for the employees needs, but also for caregiver needs, um, which, you know, something that was available to everybody. And we advertised it heavily saying over and above what you get as your regular leave balance, you have a crisis leave because this is a crisis. Uh, we put in place, we already had very strong EAP, uh, a very strong EAP program. We enhanced that and uh, we brought in, you know, telemedicine, we brought in um, better insurance benefits, we brought in a lot of programs and wellness programs as well, which really made a difference to the employee. Absolutely. I think, as you know, while I may be the editor in chief, I also founded Exchange for Media and acquired Business World. As, a, as somebody who leads an organization with my senior colleagues, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. Now, let me also move into some of the things that we don't discuss while what you put out is real and it is what is, makes the work-life balance happen and organizations are trying their best to understand and be compassionate to senior colleagues, middle-level colleagues and junior-level colleagues because they're all three have different kinds of infrastructure. They have different kinds of needs. They are, you know, they are unique. You cannot club all employees together, you know. Uh, so let me ask you a couple of uh, questions related to that. First of all, work from home, work from anywhere. Also, the meant work at ease, you know. I'm, I'm using this expression. Uh, but work at ease has made work-life balance tough. And you see moments when the webinars are happening, converse, and you have, uh, you know, house helps coming in. And the second is the issue of while performance is not gender related, I, while I'm very inclusive in the way we bring our speakers, our juries, I insist on at least 40% women, if not 50, right, in everything we do. Uh, but for women, it is a triple load. It's a load of, you know, being a mother, being a homemaker, and also being uh, a professional, and doing well at a professional work. So for women, I believe the work-life balance is even tougher than men, right? Uh, I, and especially the pandemic, 
because women are in the home, they tend to, while they've got flexibility, saved on travel time, and organizations have been compassionate to be flexi, not necessarily letting people come into office. But I personally believe, looking at my wife, looking at my uh, business school batchmates who are women, looking for my women colleagues, I think it's tougher for them to, they're doing three jobs, if not two. So how do women kind of uh, come up with work-life balance? That's a very good question. And, and I, I must admit that a lot of women face what you've just articulated, right? Um, not everybody has a help which is living help. Um, and, and during the pandemic, we, you know, during the lockdown particularly, we said, okay, let's not have anybody come in, etc. cetera. Uh, I think it's important. So, so two things, right? From an, first, let me speak from an organization's perspective, and then I will speak from a woman's perspective. Uh, from an organization perspective, we recognized this early on. And we said, you know, uh, children, pets, uh, family pets, members pets, who need pets. to be there are all welcome to the Zoom calls. There is no, uh, you know, no, take, no taking away that we've invaded their space. And if they are in the meeting, we are, they're absolutely welcome. Um, in fact, I've been in many a meeting with very heartwarming moments where, you know, dogs have jumped onto the table and cats have, uh, you know, crossed the camera. So it's absolutely welcome. In fact, there was one particular meeting where this little kid walked in and the entire meeting, which was very, you know, stressed out, absolutely kind of uh, cooled down and, you know, had the best uh, uh, de-stress moment, if I may say so. So, so that apart, we as an organization recognize that this can happen and it absolutely is welcome. Um, we also have started working with leaders or we've been working with leaders on running effective meetings and ensuring that you know, people don't burn out because of that. Um, we have received feedback that you know, in, in the interest of staying connected, we had too many Zoom video calls and, and we've been addressing that. I think now as you know, we, we start returning to office over a period of time, not that we have a you know, firm plan yet, I think one of the challenges that we will face is running hybrid meetings because you will have people working from home and you will have people uh, coming in uh, to the office. And how do you ensure that you balance it out for both populations? Today, frankly, everybody's on an even platform. Um, you know, All of us are on the Zoom call, so you have an equal opportunity. Uh, so yes, as you go along, those challenges will evolve and we will move forward. We will learn to deal with those as well. Talking about the work-life balance from a woman's perspective, I think, um, I mean, if, if I look at my own situation, right? Um, I have a very supportive partner and, and he did step in and do his part. Um, so you know, I think a woman must sit down and have that conversation with a family member. It could be anybody in the family who, who can provide that support. Like I said earlier, there's no guilt and there's no harm in asking for help. You should ask, you should share, because I think that's what makes even the family relationships grow. Um, yes, it's not, you know, sometimes you may say that it's easy to say it, but difficult to kind of really execute it. But if you don't try, you'll never know. Absolutely. Mr. Paul Dupuy, who who is the managing director for Randstad in Asia Pacific earlier, he was the managing director for three plus years in India. He's also the author of the best selling book, E5, has also joined us. And we'll bring him in at 4 30 to ask you a question and post that. My editorial colleague, Ms. Resham Suhail, will also ask you a question. But let me bring into focus some larger issues that, as an HR leader and as a business leader, you've been dealing with. You know, uh, as we are able to open up our offices. Some offices are already open. There's still some anxiety, especially there's an anxiety towards the third way. So how do we give emotional safety to our colleagues? So I think that's a very, very important question, Dr. Batra. Um, so we at Dell have been uh, tracking every country and in India's case, every city's progress very closely. Uh, we've created our own metrics of sorts where we're saying that um, number of cases, number of deaths, number of, um, you know, the, the status in the society, how, how much it's opened up, etc. We have various parameters based on which we've created a dashboard. 
this is a dashboard uh, at some point when each country grow, goes green, we make a decision along with the team member, the, the leadership on the ground on whether it is a good time to open or not. Um, we are frankly, you know, green. India is a country which is green already. And uh, we've, we've said we will take a conscious call to hold on because there is a fear of the third wave. We do not want to rush into anything where the third wave will, I mean, God forbid, if the third wave does arrive, we don't want to be caught on the wrong foot. Other than that, we are also saying that as a strategy, uh, we want to have a workforce which is empowered to be flexible. Uh, we have a very robust program called Connected Workplace. And um, if I look at our Connected Workplace program, which is available globally, we're saying, depending on the role that you play, you can work remotely, either full-time or part-time. And there are a few roles which are anchored, which where you need to come into the office. Uh, today, if I look at my enrollment across India, I have over 40% of my population, which is already enrolled on the Connected Workplace program where we are saying that um, you, know, you can either come into office one to four days a week or even five days a week if you choose to for that period of time or you know, from time to time, whenever you need to come in. And employees are embracing that. Um, in fact, we do an annual survey called Tell Dell where we ask team members various questions on um, you know, what would you like to do? How is your experience? What, how are you experiencing the Dell culture, et cetera? And the tell day that we conducted this year in May uh, gave us very interesting data on, you know, whether people would like to work remotely or come into office. We had about 85% of our population who came back and told us that they want some kind of flexibility permanently going forward. So we, we listen to our employees. Uh, we also understand that, you know, they need some help with infrastructure support, et cetera, which we are extending. And uh, we take what we can for the company. Sorry, you're on your yes, talk. Absolutely. We've discovered the virtues of flexibility of certain ways of working, which we were close to because, you know, one thing after COVID is never say never. Right? Yes. I think a lot of things can happen. I'm a very face to face person which means physical meeting, which means being in the same room at the same time. But I've discovered that I can do a lot of things. I had a mind block, you know. But also we'll have to see as we go forward, what are the behaviors that will become permanent and what are the behaviors that are contextual because we are forced to do what we are forced to do. Um, hopefully in two, three, four months, COVID is really behind us. And we can choose to take the best of both worlds, if I may use that expression. Now, let me move to another aspect. What is it you as an HR leader and a business leader? Do you think the value of HR leaders has been understood and appreciated more post-pandemic? Uh, they were already very valuable. Uh, but I think, in my view, the HR has played a crucial role in transition, in making sure the companies and individuals stay resilient and implementing the business continuity plan. What's your evaluation as an HR leader? Do you think the your bosses, overall colleagues, see HR as a different function in a new light after, after the pandemic? I think that's a very, very good question, Dr. Batra. Um, I'm fortunate to work for a company where HR is truly valued as a partner. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I've been here 18 years and uh, one of the reasons which has kept me here is clearly the ability to make a difference and partner with business. Uh, that being said, the pandemic threw up new challenges. And to your point, we took that partnership to an entirely different level. I mean, I know those, those crucial weeks when um, you know you were you were making decisions on the fly you were trying to turn things around which ideally should have taken you three months of planning you were trying to turn it around in three hours or three days um, I think I the kind of support I received as an HR leader was outstanding 
the entire business leadership came together and took on pieces of HR work. Uh, so we actually ended up creating pillars where we said, this is too much for one person to handle or one function to handle. Uh, and let's all take a part of that leadership responsibility and deliver on it. So I had the entire India leadership team taking on pieces of uh, pillars of work, which made a difference to an employee at that critical time. Um, so yes, you're absolutely right. That partnership that we always had went to an entirely different level. Uh, going forward, if I have to kind of look at HR's role with the business, I think that experience really has um, will will make a difference even in the terms of what HR will deliver. Uh, yes, we were HR, business was business. We partnered to a certain extent and we handed over business activities to business. But going forward, if business could take over HR work and deliver on it so beautifully, why can't HR take over the business work and try and reciprocate that? I think that's what is bound to happen as you move forward. Absolutely. My last question before I bring in Mr. Paul Dupuis and Ms. Resham Sohail on the camera, and I hope they're ready and so is my team at BW People. Uh, let me ask you, going forward, as an HR leader, what are the trends you see in terms of workspace, in terms of the future of work, in terms of uh, what the organizations are seeing in the future? Because uh, you helm a very large uh, workforce. Uh, so you clearly understand the aspiration and the change behavior of lots of your colleagues and also the change business imperative. Uh, we are becoming more and more technology savvy, digital savvy. We're truly becoming a digital economy in the true sense of it, in a deep way. So what are the future trends that Ms. Ritu Rakhra sees that can be relevant to the HR fraternity and business leaders on this broadcast? That's, that's a very, loaded question, doctor, but I will try and answer it as best as I can. Um, if I were to look at the future of the workforce um, in our country, I think two things are bound to happen. One, uh, there is clearly a culture of work from anywhere, which will take root, uh, which means that we will really be able to leverage talent across the country. Uh, you could be in a small town, a small village. Uh, in fact, my own team is working from places I hadn't even heard of. You know, I had to go and figure out which state that, that place falls in. Um, so I think we will really be able to get jobs to people across the board, wherever they are, and for whatever reason, they want to continue to be there. So that will be the first change uh, which will take place very quickly. The second thing I see happening is people will recognize that uh, or people will feel the need to use their skills not only in one place. Um, I think more and more our young uh, team members feel that they want to broad base their experience. They want to broad base their ability to contribute. So you will have the gig workers which, which will, uh, you know, sprout everywhere and you will have the gig workers who will thrive uh, as we move forward i think uh, you know we we are also seeing a lot of changes in our labor codes as we move forward and that will also create the right environment to have these gig workers uh, you know really uh, be successful make them really successful so these are two key changes as we move forward absolutely at this point, let me bring in Mr. Paul Duffy, who's the author of a best-selling book on leadership called The E-5 Moment or The Rule of Five. Uh, he's also the managing director for Asia Pacific for Randstad and really understands cultural nuances and compassion uh, better than a lot of leaders I've met. So Paul, uh, we welcome you. We know you're in Japan and you're joining the broadcast from Japan. We'd request you to uh, switch on your camera and ask a question to Ritu. Paul? Good evening from Tokyo. Good evening. And hi, Ritu. Greetings. Hi, Paul. Nice to meet you. 
Great to meet you too. I think our paths have crossed in the past, I'm sure, but uh, great to see you here this evening. Yeah. You know, I, I just was coming to the end of my day here in Tokyo in the evening, and I always check in on BW Business World and my, my old friend, Anurag, here. And uh, what a great topic today. Thank you for the conversation. I wanted to ask you a question, Ritu. I think you and I share some uh, similar challenges and opportunities being in the region here in APAC. And of course, I was in India for the past four years. I just relocated to Japan. Um, what do you see from an, the perspective of India? If we look back to March 2020, when we really shifted into this new way of working and all the lessons that have been learned along the way, the wisdom gained, what lessons do you think have been born and realized in India that could be exported to the world? Wow, that's a fantastic question. Um, so Paul, let me step back to 2020, March. Um, I think all the companies went home to work from home practically overnight. A uh, few things happened then. I think our government moved very quickly to ease up certain regulatory uh, issues which enable people to go work from home. And I think thereafter, during the course of the pandemic, some of these temporary changes, like you know the um, STPI changes, so on and so forth, have been made permanent. So the government is recognizing the fact that we need to allow this work from anywhere option. So that was one of the key things which happened. The second thing which happened was all our businesses, that is not just in Dell, but across the country, everybody realized the value of digital. Today you have uh, gyms which are digital, <laughs> you, you, you have Zumba classes from the uh, you know, an offering the gym which is digital, you have um, you know, everything being sold online, you even have all our health data and vaccination certificates which is digital. As we've been working uh, through the pandemic and recognizing and keeping pace with what the government requires us to do, one of the things we realized is we are one of the few countries which have these digital records. Mm -hmm. uh, so clearly that is one of the things I think we can look at um, offering the other countries in the world uh, in terms of the entire infrastructure we've put together on our health uh, management in the pandemic. The other piece um, that I think that we can, um, I, I actually, I don't think that that's something we can export. That's something which is happening globally is, is the digitization of businesses. Uh, now, this is clearly a great opportunity for uh, the global economies and companies like ours. And uh, we will leverage that as we go forward and ensure that everybody has an opportunity to be successful. Thank you for that. I, you know, I'm, I'm listening to, I'm nodding the whole time because I was there through even the worst times of COVID. I returned to, or I moved to Japan in late April. So it was really, uh, really at the toughest time. And, and it was a tough time to leave. My heart is still in India in many ways. Uh, but I have to say, I admire the resilience of the people of India through this crisis, the agility that I saw with my teams there. And I would say even with Anurag, we've seen Anurag and Business World reinvent themselves uh, in a very short period of time. Um, and, and I think, uh, as you said earlier, never say never. Huh? It's, uh, so crisis does bring opportunity, still yet to be seen, but I think there's a lot of lessons le learned from India. So thank you. Thank you for that observation. I absolutely agree. Thank you, Paul, for joining in and always uh, making the conversation relevant and asking something real and contributing to it. Thank you for your time. We miss you back in India. Hope to engage with you in more conversation. Let me now bring in uh, my editorial colleague, Ms. Resham Soel, who is part of the editorial team at BW People. Resham, you and Ritri. Around 30% of professionals are ready to leave their company uh, instead of compensating on their work-life balance. So Ms. Rakhna, do you believe that work-life balance is one of the major driving factors for retailing, retaining talent? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So let, let me give you some data there, Asham, since you, you know, picked up some data. Uh, we, the same Teldel survey that I spoke alluded to earlier, uh, we had a question there in terms of uh, what makes people stay at Dell. And the number one, absolutely the number one reason was work-life balance. Uh, number two was company culture. Number three was leaders, right? 
um, and we had over 58% of our people say that the reason they love working at Dell is the work-life balance that we offer. So yes, uh, work-life balance has been important, you know, always, but more so now. Um, it's easy to just continue working and never switch off. Uh, but we've created opportunities for people to de-stress. We've, we've been running significant wellness programs. We've been working, uh, you know, uh, on our employee resource groups, which, which really give people an opportunity to contribute and give back to society. We've been um, running a lot of CSR work, even remotely. So I think all of those also uh, contribute to a person's sense of well-being and work-life balance. So yes, absolutely agree with you that you know we we that is a key driving factor for team members to stay with the company. Thank you so much, Ritu. Thank let you so me, much. Thank you so much. My, let me ask you my last question, and Paul, if you want to ask one more question, you'll be welcome. My last question is: as an HR leader and a business leader, has your use of technological tools, HR technology, gone up significantly? And how do you see, uh, you know, the future trends, especially in terms of technology adoption by HR professionals? No, I, I think that's a fantastic question. Um, you know, as we spoke about the trend of everything getting digitized, right? Um, so at Dell, we already had most of our processes digitized already. Uh, but the small pieces which were non-digital, example, let's take the onboarding process. Um, clearly, when the person showed up on day one, we we did have a face-to-face -face interaction. And uh, while, while, while the process, the document filling, et cetera, was already dig digitized, I think there was that personal face-to-face -face, uh, day one experience, which was offered to uh, employees who were joining us. We practically overnight turned that also digital. And uh, I think uh, today we have the ability to take any HR process and make it digital. Um, you know, sometimes when you say human relations, human touch, uh, you, you've got that missing, but you, you've got to do it to stay with the times. Um, while we have the ability to do everything digital, um, I think at some point we will go back to some, uh, you know, face-to-face uh, -face kind of interaction. Um, it depends on what the activity is and what the situation is. Uh, um, so yes, uh, automation is something that has become even stronger and, and uh, will continue to be so as we go along. Thank you so much, uh, Ritu. And Paul, uh, your last question. I, I do have a question for Ritu as well, something that we're all debating now. Um, and I'm sure at Dell, you have similar uh, insights. At Randstad, we're in 38 countries and we actually have done surveys of our employees. And here's what we found. This word called hybrid is being interpreted in many different ways around the world. And so we've divided into three simple groups, about 10 to 15%, depending on the country, it's a bit different. Let's say 10 to 15% of our employees don't want to return to the office ever. That's how they feel today. They're, for whatever reason, some are afraid, some feel actually I'm much more productive at home. Don't make me go to the office. So that's 10 to 15% of our working population. The largest portion is somewhere between 65 to 70% that says, I want to work in a hybrid way of working and defining hybrid in different ways. But the global average we've come up with is 2.2 days average per week in the office. And that scale varies a bit. Here in Japan, I can tell you it's closer to three because people like to be there. I, I would guess in India, a very social country, that probably it's leaning more you know, towards the higher zone. I'm not sure, I wanted to hear your idea on that. And then the remaining part of the working population is saying, I wanna to go to the office every day, let me out of my house. I wanna be with people, I need to be with people. Three categories, I'm curious to get your thoughts on, you know, your take on this thing called So, So we did a similar survey, right? Same tell them. And um, we had, like I, I mentioned earlier, 85% of our people who wanted some amount of flexibility. Now, if I were to break that 85% down, I believe we had 52% which said that I wanted to be um, hybrid. So I will come to office one day to even five days a week, depending on my choice and, and the need of the business, 
right? So we have people who are going up to five days. But I think, um, and, and I can't be uh, absolutely sure, but you're right. Even our average of what they wanted to be in office was two days was you know the, the maximum population. Mm -hmm. uh, we had about 33% who said, I want to be entirely remote. I don't want to come into office at all. And the others uh, were anchored. We call them anchored largely because maybe the jobs cannot be done remotely. Um, so yes, I think it's going to be an interesting exercise where uh, you know we we see how we manage these different workloads, and we manage uh, sorry not workforces I mean, and I think the most interesting part of that will be to see how we drive the team dynamics to ensure that we continue to brainstorm, we continue to innovate, we continue to do all the good things that uh, we've been able to do while being in office. Uh, so this is our next challenge. And uh, we're looking forward to it. Right, thank so, you. So thank you for those comments, Paul. Thank you for that question. Resham has the last question. She'll ask that, and we'll wrap up this BW People Dialogue. Resham, your last question. Uh, yes. So, Ms. Raka, I mean, what is your personal mantra for your work-life balance? Uh, I follow my heart, Resham. Uh, while I did say that, you know, um, it's, so, so it's a structured follow your heart, right? Where you say that, yes, you've made a complete assessment of what you need. You've, you've analyzed what is important to you. But at the end of the day, you've got to put it all into a structure um, and, and ensure that what makes you happy has enough time and space. Uh, if you do that, I think you're in a very happy spot. Thank you, Thank, you. Thank you, Paul. It was a pleasure speaking. Have a great week. All three of you. Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Stay Love safe, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.